My name is Nick Middleton. I'm middle-aged, I live in Middle England and earn a middling salary writing travel books and teaching geography at Oxford University. My life is extremely comfortable, or rather it was. It all changed when I started writing about the world's most extreme environments. The more I suffered in these godforsaken places, the more I saw that it's the hostile landscapes that have shaped man's existence on Earth. One of the most hostile is the vast area that has kept east and west apart. Crossable only via the network of trading routes known as the Silk Road, this wilderness of mountains, plateaus and deserts is one of the least populated on Earth. But life is sustained there. Just what sort of life my publisher felt was up to me to find out. My journey begins in the mountains of heaven and will end at the gates of hell. Now, I'm a geographer and I've always been intrigued by the delicate balance of existence in arid lands. Here, water is the key to life. When it's well managed, even marginal environments flourish. But when it's mismanaged, the consequences can be catastrophic. My ultimate destination is the Aral Sea in western Kazakhstan, an environmental disaster zone I'd written about but never seen. Until the 1960s, the Aral was the world's fourth largest freshwater lake, but since then the rivers feeding it had been diverted for irrigation, and in just 40 years the sea has become a polluted shadow of its former self. What I wanted to know was how the locals have survived since most of their former livelihood had evaporated. My research threw up a piece of video footage which hinted at just how desperate things had become. Some former fishermen had turned to looting an abandoned bioweapons research site on an island in the middle of the sea. I was going to the Aral to find these men but since the island, Vosrozdeny, had been a test zone for anthrax, smallpox and Ebola, I had come prepared. A bioprotection suit would, with luck, keep me alive. But my first test session wearing it, here on a salt flat far from the Aral Sea, was no fun at all. I've set up the uh, portable weather station here, with a temperature sensor beneath an umbrella. So it's just measuring the uh, temperature of the air, not direct solar radiation. And uh, this is telling me that it's uh, 39.3 degrees C, which is uh, 103 degrees F. So either way you take it, yeah, it's pretty hot. My journey to the Aral began on the other side of Kazakhstan, in the eastern corner, at the leafy former capital, Almaty. It looked at first like a typical Soviet-era 20th century city, but after a few hours you quickly saw signs that it's been around for a while. Indeed, my English-speaking guide, Bayan, immediately reinforced this impression of antiquity. She insisted that anyone undertaking any sort of journey, let alone one to the dead zone of the Aral Sea, had to consult with a shaman first. <laughs> We were in what is officially a modern Muslim nation, but according to Bayan, healers and witch doctors like Zebek still abound. Can you tell her I'm heading towards the Aral Sea and ask if she can offer me any help or advice? Zbek said that she prayed for you and she will be praying all your way 
to the RLC. She can help you with her remedy, like a knife and uh, other uh, Kazakh traditional healing. Healing with a knife? Yes. Why not? <laughs> OK, as long as she's careful. How big's the knife? Before the knife came smoke purification. <laughs> there were plenty of takers at Zebek's session. The collapse of the Soviet machine, with its employment, housing and pensions, had led to a huge surge in demand for shamanic skills. Fear and uncertainty, it seems, breed belief. As the smoke cleared, Zebek's knife came out. It didn't exactly look ancient. It didn't even look that shamanic. But it did look quite like a kitchen devil. The healing ended with my arteries thankfully intact, but we weren't allowed to leave until we'd listened to a serenade from a man dressed in the Arsenal 2002 away strip. Surfing on a wave of Zebek's protection, I set off on my 2,000 kilometer journey due west across this vast Central Asian Republic to the Aral Sea. Along the way, if our rickety looking jeep hung on, I was hoping to see how the people survive here. For as you go west, so it gets drier, and water plays an ever more important role. But first, this is the steppe, the term for the rolling grasslands of Central Asia, which seem to go on forever and ever. I'd left Bayan to her shamanic devices in Almaty, but had hired Altai Zatkanbiev to translate for me as we headed west. This road is typical Kazakh highway. It's not so good in, <laughs> as the European highways. After five hours of non-stop potholes, we stopped for a break at a settlement of what Altai called typical Kazakh nomads, where he was proud to show me 20-odd mares lined up for milking. What are they doing here, milking the horses? Yes, yes, typical ah. Kazakh uh, tradition. Usually in this process, uh, women attendants, because uh, horse milking has traditionally women. This milk using by local Kazakh people, it's necessary special preparation. We use uh, special bacteria. Um, Are they fermented? Uh, so, yeah, fermented, uh, exactly. And so it's slightly alcoholic when you drink it? Yes. Though it was balmy here in July, in winter temperatures on the steppe plummet to 40 degrees below. Cows can't handle life that cold, but these seemingly fragile horses are fine, and without their meat, these people would find it hard to survive. Doubtless the horse milk beer helps keep the chill out too. My first contact with the Kazakhs of the steppe couldn't have been more tranquil and I was beginning to think that the stereotypical image of the fierce steppe warrior was obviously outdated, which only goes to show how wrong you can be. It was Saturday afternoon, and Altai, trying to undo the harm done to the Kazakhs' hard man reputation by the pastoral scene of the morning, took me to the game. This is Kokpa. It starts with the beheading of a live goat and gets progressively more violent as the fun continues. It's thought to have been invented by Genghis Khan's followers as the ultimate test of man and horse. In very brief terms, how do you win this game? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Nick, would you like to train again on the horse 
and uh, attending for this game, Kokpar. <laughs> what do you like? Me? Yeah. Have a yeah. go? Yeah. You're mad, no way. Not in a hundred million zillion years. Yeah. Looks really dangerous. Really dangerous, yo. Needless to say, I soon found myself in the saddle of what thankfully looked like a very docile horse and hung out on the edges of a melee. Koter, koter, and koter! Okay, get 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 My horse seemed only to want to go backwards, much to the amusement of the spectators. When it came to the final game of the afternoon, I was still in the saddle. I'm not sure if I was being humoured or if the horseman just took pity on me, but suddenly, miraculously, I found myself in the middle of the action. Though as soon as I was gifted the goat, they got tough, and I headed for the touchline. Total madness. I mean, they really go for it. And when I, I actually look, I've still, still got a bit of the, ah, the goat's hair in my hand. Um, and I had a good hold of it, but then two other guys came from nowhere and... And it, it's a good job a horse is a solid animal, because otherwise you'd come off in a second. It really would. It's, uh, it's truly symbolic of the, the wild, wide open horse roaming step, because that's what it's all about. The Kazakhs of the lush steppe were certainly hard. But as we moved west into the desert lands, life was much more difficult. With very little rainfall, almost all the available water comes from rivers rising in the mountains. The problem is that most of the rivers are diverted into irrigation schemes long before they reach their final natural destination. Somewhere still more than a thousand kilometers to the west, the Aral Sea was dying of thirst. My journey across the vast Central Asian Republic of Kazakhstan continued, pushing towards the west and my final destination of the Aral Sea. Scorched by the searing continental heat of the summer, where temperatures can reach 50 degrees centigrade, the landscape was becoming more arid. Unlike the verdant steppe, this area cannot support large herds of livestock. Life is more marginal, and while the people do keep sheep, goats and horses, hunting is also a major part of life. Our route wound through the Charin Canyon, a spectacular chasm eroded by river waters over countless millennia. It's a bleak and pitiless place, and perhaps not surprisingly, it's home to a particularly pitiless Kazakh predator, the Golden Eagle. Altai had friends who were some of the last Kazakh practitioners of the suitably macho art of hunting with eagles. He's quite excited by that. <laughs> the speed with which... A bit completely silent. My noise is totally inappropriate. These birds have been trained here for at least a thousand years, helping not only to bring food to the table, but also keeping predatory wolves and foxes away from precious livestock. So, the hand moving is, is like that. Mm -hmm. And then as it swoops in, mm -hmm. like that, yeah? yeah? Yeah. What are the chances of it, say, I don't know, landing on my head? Uh, it's sometimes uh, it's possible, but, uh, but now it's uh, very correct sitting on the, your uh, hand. Yeah. Sometimes it's possible. <laughs> Thanks, Altai. Do you want to have a go? <laughs> okay. I'm ready. <laughs> no. Okay, once. I just think positive. Think. Yeah. Standing here. Yeah, yeah, of course, because uh, Golden Eagle showing. Yes, this. that's yes. what he's after. No, not on no, the yeah, your hand. Not, no. <laughs> okay. Well, I'm ready. Mm -hmm. Bech Mukan had made it look easy enough, but he had a lifetime of experience behind him. As they gave me the glove and the tempting morsel of rabbit, I could only hope this most supreme of predators 
would be gentle with me. My first attempt was a bit of an embarrassment. The eagle, perhaps unnerved by a face she didn't really know, overshot the mark. Is he enjoying that? Just wind, really. Yeah, it was so precise. Extraordinary. Really extraordinary, the power and grace. So all that power and yet the slightest touch. <laughs> My heart's going boom, boom. Just <laughs> after beginning. Another piece of rabbit was prepared, and after a few more tips, I was ready to try again. So give it one little twiddle, yes. and then turn and stay still. Yes, exactly. Okay. Gel, come on! Gel! 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 Is that my fault? Gel! Gel! Nick! According to Bek Mukan, it takes anything up to three years to train a golden eagle. Such a light landing. And every time you fly it from your fist, there's no guarantee that it will ever come back. It's a practice utterly out of pace with the 21st century. Not a lot there. Two weeks into my journey, I continued to the west. We passed the city of Shimkent, on into the desert heartlands of Central Asia. I was heading for the village of Shawildia, near to where one of Kazakhstan's greatest cities, Otra, had once stood. I had read that water, or rather the lack of it, had been a crucial factor in the city's decline, and I was wondering if there was a historical parallel between the story of the ancient Otra and the contemporary disaster of the Aral Sea. In order to find out, I was making contact with an Italian archaeologist called Renato Sala, the leader of a unique aerial survey based in Shawaldia. We cross now a very interesting place, Otrar is called, it's an old oasis, more than 80 villages and towns, interconnected by a network of canals, using the waters of the Aris River. But of course they are very old, until 1,800 years ago. Some of, you, don't, you cannot see them even if you walk on them sometimes, oh, but by so aerial by photo. Aerial, you can, yes. The area Renato was studying, near the confluence of the Aris and Sidaria rivers, had, since before the time of Christ, been home to a flourishing civilization, expert at water management. As you can see, there are many old towns. These uh, mounds are big towns, remains of accumulation of layers. These sort of big, yes. Uh, right. uh, yeah. We are in arid zones, so uh, saving water use, catching rare water use, managing correctly the, the water That's are the about. main bases of life. Of course, yeah. It's very interesting for me, because uh, I'm travelling towards the Aral Sea. Oh, why? Why? To see the disaster, to see what's left of it. Renato took me to meet his pilots, proud owners of the two microlights. Yo. Come, Nick. I introduce you to my pilots. Thank you very much. Okay. Yes. You How do you do? You do. You. Nick. Hi. <laughs> Igor. You get Igor. We have Hi. a guest. Twice a day, the pilots would fly Renato and his colleagues on aerial surveys, enabling them to photograph and map the historic sites of the oasis and their relationship to ancient waterways. 80 kilometer, 100 kilometer an hour is the normal pace. Okay. Yes, they can go on for two and a half hours, so for 250 kilometers. Oh, I see, you can get two people. Yes, you want to try? The passenger. Yeah, yeah, sure, why not? <laughs> Maybe I should put something else on. <laughs> or, yeah. or we'll just, just try sitting. Am I allowed to grab hold of that? They try a short, a short tour. A short tour. Yeah, maybe. Straight yeah. away, huh? We take off from the from the asphalt, from the main road. We wait that the car they are not uh, disturbing, <laughs> and we take out. And then when we land, we jump on the last car, <laughs> and we try to stop before the coming one. I see. Yeah. 
Renato had decided we would head out to the site of the ancient city of Atra, one of 80 such monuments dotted around the region. So little is known about these historic settlements that almost every flight brings new discoveries. As we taxied out onto the road, something Renato had said was nagging away in my mind. And I wondered if I'd heard correctly when he'd said that this homemade flying machine had been constructed in a cave. From the air, the raised outline of the ancient city was unmistakable. A 20 meter high mound created at a rate of roughly a meter every hundred years by an accumulation of debris and building rubble. Our bird's eye view gave us the perfect perspective on the 2,000 year old city, abandoned when the local river changed its course. The microlight flights have become an effective tool for Renato and his team, identifying promising locations from the air, then undertaking ground surveys to map and excavate the sites. It looks like a, a, a big house of some kind. This is a mosque, 1,200 up to Christ. Tell your fire to turn, we go back. Okay, turning now. The flight had given a fascinating insight into what happens when water disappears. But I had to confess I was glad when the homemade microlite finally touched down. That evening, Renato took me an hour's drive north to show me the sort of landscape that had surrounded Atra 2,000 years ago. It's the availability of water that really does dictate the entire history of the region, it seems to me, and the future too, with the declining levels of the RC. Yes, it's always, it's always that in these early civilizations. Water built civilization and destroy, and the lack of water destroys civilization. Water also built stationary camps and kick out the people from this place when it's finished. Mm. Otra born in a, in a landscape like this one, you see. How it could be up there, this landscape, where there are now these dry towns? The river course was different. Mm -hmm. I come very often after working in, in these uh, deserted areas that they were before blossoming with ponds and canals. I come here, I see the, 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 the pri primary, primary landscape of Utrah. Yeah. And I get my swim, I relax. It is totally relaxing, isn't mm -hmm. it? The next day, Renato proposed another flight, this time to visit a camp he'd established out in the desert. But things didn't go quite as smoothly as they had the day before. Renato had only been in the air for a few minutes when an engine fault set in. With his power failing, the pilot desperately searched for a place to land. We were grounded somewhere on a desert road in Kazakhstan with one of our microlights out of action. To my alarm, the only spare part available seemed to be a roll of wire. I saw this wire Ah, it's scary, this uh, <laughs> manipulation of wires. <laughs> there are no screws in there, do you think they all touch? <laughs> 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 just lost some screws. <laughs> <laughs> all three of them, they're completely empty. They look sort they of important see it, to they me. Didn't see it. That's the old dimension. And they're working on the other side. Yeah. With Renato's microlight beyond repair, he kindly took my aircraft and fixed me up with a jeep for the three-hour journey down to the desert camp. Hey, Nick. Hey, Renato. Hey, Nick. You beat us to it. Welcome. <laughs> How long have hey. you been here? Half an hour. 
Half an hour? Quicker than you, of yeah, course. Yeah, much quicker. <laughs> Still, the camp's all ready, huh? <laughs> yes, everything up. Renato and his team were on a four-day expedition to survey new archaeological sites to the southeast of the Otrar oasis. I was keen to see some of the ancient river courses myself, but not so keen to be getting back in the microlite. Homemade microlites. <laughs> they really are homemade. I mean, the wings are from Ukraine, the tires are Chinese. I saw a couple of tubes which said made in Iran. They're sort of international congress of parts knocked up in someone's back room, which sounds fun. It is quite fun, and they are ingenious, and they do fly. Well, at least one of them flies now. One of them's broken down, which slightly worries me. You know, 50% loss rate isn't too good. Why is the camp here precisely? Because we suspect ancient habitats here, in this desert. The desert is uh, all, all some possibility of life, and sometimes it gets watered by river courses that then they disappear. Like now, you are sitting on the old course of the Sirdaria. You uh, see. This is, is one of the old courses yes, of the river? Yes, yes. It switched uh, 1,200 years ago. So the, the central purpose here is to survey ancient settlements along former courses of the river? Yes to prove the, uh, the existence of habitats along this course and to date by ceramics yeah. or by other uh, more sophisticated uh, ways mm -hmm. the, the, the monuments that we find. Knowing that I was interested to see and photograph the prehistoric watercourses, Renato offered me the microlite for the morning and gave me some advice on the most likely direction to take. Is the best way is, is go in this direction, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Once airborne, I could clearly see the ancient waterways Renato had been talking about. Even the majestic sweep of a prehistoric river meander was easy to pick out. The fact that these once great rivers had either disappeared or changed course was a reminder of how dramatically environments can change over time. The difference between this scenario and the Aral Sea, of course, was that this was presumably a natural occurrence and not caused by the negligence of man. Then I picked out some shapes etched on the desert floor, evidently the work of man. And as far as I could judge, they seemed both abandoned and ancient enough to be of interest. I took a series of stills and fixed the location with the GPS. And then we returned to camp. I spent a further couple of days with Renato and his team at the desert camp. And we then returned to the Atrar oasis. On my final day there, I dropped in to Renato's alfresco office to find out if my discovery had been of any interest. Ah, uh, Renato. Hey, Nick. Good morning. Good morning. Yes. Yeah, that's the big one I was telling you about. Yes, this is the most interesting picture you took. Is it? Yes. And it's the first time that we, we have an aerial picture of, the, of this monument. Of That's the, the first aerial photograph of this settlement. Of this settlement, and uh, we have new information, new, uh, the, the verification of our hypothesis, first of all, and then new data that we don't understand. We, we Beginner's need. luck had been on my side. The settlements, it turned out, may have been as much as 2,000 years old. You can see the full transformation. My time with Renato and his team had shown that this lost civilization was far more sophisticated in its water management than anyone had previously thought. And, uh, and yet, when the river had changed its course, even they had crossed a threshold of survivability. I was heading for the Aral Sea at a time when its people were facing a similar water crisis. But in contrast to Renato's historical picture, I was going to experience it firsthand. This is the, the next phase, is to go on land again and to verify what is shown in your picture. This is another day. Another time. I have yes. to go, I'm afraid. Yes, I would like to keep you here longer. I would love to stay longer, but I have another mission, as you know. To this dangerous island there? Yeah. Why there? Yeah. Listen, Nick. It's an extreme place, Renate. I like extreme places. You look so soft and you are so tough. <laughs> Nick. <laughs> Too kind. Bye, now, Nick. Come back one thank day. Thank you very much. Yes, bye. The whole purpose of this trip is to go and see the Aral Sea. That's the ultimate goal. But, and it's a big but in, the, in capital letters, but I want to go to this island, Vos Island, 
However, it was a Soviet biological weapons testing site. <laughs> How clean is it? No one seems to know. Everyone now has admitted that it was used for testing, open air testing, of all sorts of nasty smallpox, uh, Venezuelan equine encephalitis, Q fevers, uh, things I've never even heard of. Anthrax is a big one, and anthrax is the big danger because anthrax lasts a long time. It's been cleaned up, but no one seems to know how effectively. So I'm well equipped, and I've been briefed on how to uh, protect myself from what is just an instantly fatal disease. But at the same time, that makes me rather nervous, to say the least. This was it. After more than 2,000 kilometers on the road, I had finally reached my destination, the site of one of the world's worst environmental disasters. With me was Zanat Makambatova, an ecologist working with one of the many NGOs in the disaster zone, which is, or rather was, the Aral Sea. Yes, how long have these ships been here? Since the 80s. Zanat took me to see a surreal ship graveyard. The sea level was once as high as the cliffs that surrounded the site, and these fishing boats were left high and dry, stark reminders of the misguided Soviet cotton irrigation schemes that diverted the rivers that previously fed the Aral. It's such a dramatic picture of these dead ships without the sea anywhere. You can't see the sea anywhere at all, can you? So, it's a symbol. It is a symbol. Of a uh, disaster. Symbol of the disaster. Oh, OK. And all my life I saw that we do not have sea anymore. And when people asked me, OK, you're from the Aral Sea region. Uh, OK, uh, where is your sea? I said, OK, we do not have sea. We do not have sea. You thought it had completely disappeared? Yes, yes, yeah. I was absolutely sure in this. And. Uh, when I came to the sea in 1996, and the first time I was sea, I saw it, I was shocked. These rusting wrecks were part of a once huge fleet, taking up to 44,000 tonnes of fish from the Aral each year. Now the tonnage taken is barely worth measuring. It must have been employment for many, many people. Yeah, yeah, many people worked on these ships. Zanat explained that the majority of the Aral fishermen turned to breeding livestock, such as camels. Others, unable to eke a living out of the highly saline and polluted seabed, were forced out of the region and into an uncertain future elsewhere. Gosh. I wonder what the camels think. That evening, 60 kilometers east of the stranded ships, we found the shore and a lone fisherman laying out his nets. This form of subsistence fishing is all that is left on the Aral Sea, mostly catching introduced saltwater species like flounder, which can cope with the high levels of salinity. Yeah, quite salty, isn't it? Yeah. I don't think it's quite as salty as the sea, but almost. Somewhere out there was my final destination, the island of Vosrozdine, the toxic heart of this dying sea. After crossing Kazakhstan, I had arrived in the northwest corner of the Aral Sea at the village of Kulandi. I was hoping to make contact with villagers rumored to be looting an abandoned bioweapons site on an island in the sea. When the Aral shrank in size, these former fishing villages faced a stark future. But as I had already discovered earlier in my journey, the Kazakhs are past masters at adapting to a life in an extreme environment. In order to survive the potentially life-threatening hazards ahead, I would need expert guidance and help. I'm, very looking, I'm really looking forward to it. <laughs> yeah, I have to say that. It was time to rendezvous with Dave Butler, a specialist advisor with a useful working knowledge of how to survive nuclear and biological threats. It's highly carcinogenic, so we don't want to breathe it in. Of course, you have to bear in mind, of course, that death can be fatal from breathing this stuff in. Yeah, right, I'll remember know. that, so, Dave. Uh, the pack itself contains its own three-litre water supply. Mm. 
we'll take another litre or so just in the, just in the top there. I've uh, had some quite loose bell movements in the last 24 hours. Um, now I've taken some stoppers, but what's the story with the suits? Can you actually... Yeah, if, if we need to, we'll take you through a quick urination and defecation drill. You know, because, uh, again, there'll be no question of doing it in the suit. You know, if you, yeah, no, <laughs> if you do it in not. the suit, I mean, let alone anything else, none of us will want to be around you because you'll stink, yeah. you know. So uh, we'll, we'll just, uh, we'll cope with that. But just try and give me a bit of notice, you know, if you if you are feeling a bit queasy. Okay, okay. <clears throat> yeah, yeah. I'll take some more bum stoppers, yeah. just to be sure. Yeah. Good, I think mean, it's time for dinner, don't you? Yeah, good idea. It's uh, 20 past seven, uh, the night before I'm due to go to the island, and uh, I just came out for a pass water and saw that on the horizon. And it looks like a cloud, but it's completely different from the clouds up above. I can only think it's got to be a dust cloud, and it's vast, like 180 degrees along the horizon up there. You can see the leading edge of it, and it's, oh, that's west because the sun's setting. And the whole thing is just coming, <laughs> coming towards us. And it's a phenomenal size. Absolutely extraordinary. I've never seen one the size of this before. And no one seems to be uh, taking that much notice. But the wind is definitely freshening. And I don't know if you can hear those camels. But uh, they think something's going on. The dust storm had been created by an incoming weather front, whipping up thousands of tons of particles into the air. So it's a true dust storm and a vast one. I've literally never seen anything this size before. And you know what, it's extremely lucky that we're going to the uh, island tomorrow, because if this had happened on the island, well, I mean, it'd just be anthrax silly, wouldn't it? It'd be everywhere, absolutely everywhere. It's extraordinary. <laughs> it's really great. Really great. Everyone's going in their houses, but it's just good to be out there. I don't think the cameras like it very much. Extraordinary. Really extraordinary. We were going to Vosrozdeny in the morning, and I couldn't decide whether the dust storm boded good or ill. This is it. The uh, vehicles are getting ready to leave. And now's the time we start wading out to the boats. Fortunately, it's not that deep. I don't think, just looking uh, at the guys who are wading out there now. This is the moment. This is when it really all begins. Through a series of local contacts, a team of looters had agreed to take us to Anthrax Island. Former fishermen, the men were victims of the Aral Sea's decline, and facing a future without work, they had turned to looting old Soviet sites, stripping out copper pipes and building materials. I was sympathetic to their plight, but I couldn't help wondering if what they told me was the whole story. The island is rumoured to have numerous burial sites where lethal drums of anthrax were left by the Soviets, and I couldn't help wondering what the market value of such a commodity might be in the post-9-11 world. Welcome to Anthrax Island. As far as we knew, we were the first British people ever to set foot in this place. As soon as we arrived, even though the former research base was still 25 miles away, Dave advised me to put on the bioprotection suit. We offered the same suits and masks to the locals, but astonishingly, they declined our offer. 
telling us they'd visited the site many times and never got sick. Riding pillion on the rickety old bikes, we left for the two-hour desert ride to the bioweapons site. We got there just before midday, as the temperature nudged up above 40 degrees. The looters vanished into the city on their mysterious mission, leaving us alone to explore this deeply disturbing ghost town. From the late 50s to the early 90s, this was home to several thousand bio-warfare specialists, their support staff and families. Vos Island Bioweapons Research Testing Station Housing Complex. So it's gone midday. It took eight hours to get here. I still can't believe it. But what an extraordinary place. This looks, like a, this looks like a hazard template. It was clear the Soviets had left in a hurry. But what had they actually done with the huge stocks of weaponized smallpox, the anthrax, the botulinum toxin? And all sorts of just weird stuff going on. <laughs> I don't know what this place was, what those wires were for. Just like that, all over. The buildings you can go in or you feel safe to go in. Most of them have been so badly smashed up, I don't want to actually venture inside because they look potentially dangerous. And when I stop like that, there's a silence that's truly eerie. We left the housing complex and entered the nerve centre of the laboratory itself. In these buildings, the Soviets concocted the most virulent strains of bacteria known to man. We made a sinister discovery just inside the door, a respirator lying on the floor, a clear sign that something potentially lethal might be lurking within. These rooms were straight from an Orwellian nightmare. I wondered what unfortunate soul had been strapped to that bed. At that moment, a pungently strong smell entered the respirators. No, yeah, I can smell Smell of urine. Yeah. How can I? How, how come to this? Yeah. Yeah. Like that as well. Still a small. Still ammonia. Yeah. 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 Unnerved by what we'd seen in the lab, we decided to explore another area of the site. But what we found there was even more disturbing. Right. Test tubes, pipettes and petri dishes, thousands and thousands of them. And who could say what evil concoctions they contained? Um, this sort yeah. of feels dangerous to me. But it's a very good indicator of the sort of the, the scale there. of which they were actually testing uh, various bits and pieces by the sheer quantity that you can see yeah. in this uh, in the store. Let's have a look down the side here, Nick. There's something down here. Uh, what's the head on there? Oh yeah. It's three-dimensional hazards, isn't it? Yeah. I really nearly brain yeah. myself. Yeah, here's the, um, here's the breathing apparatus that they used to use. 
so you just go over the head and yeah. they probably go to some sort of air fed system filtered system so that they're breathing clean air This is horrific, it's just terrifying. But there is, I suppose, a bit of an irony in that all the time over the last few years I've spent traveling to the physical extremes of the planet, be it the cold of Siberia, the swamps of Papua, or the heat of Danakil, wherever I've gone, humans have always managed somehow to scrape a living. It's only here in this squalid plague spot, festering in the heart of another, even larger man-made disaster, that there's no possible way people can live. I mean, there could be anthrax spores in that test tube, this, this place is just too lethal, too lethal. We still hadn't solved the mystery of what the looters were actually doing on Vos Rosdeny. Were they merely after building materials or was there something more sinister about their frequent trips to the island? Whatever the case, they definitely weren't telling us. Four hours later, we were back on the boat ride home. For Dave and myself, an escape from the Aral Sea was a simple question of taking the next flight out. But it occurred to me, as I washed away any remaining anthrax spores, that for the people of the Aral Sea, there is no such escape. Their environment has been mismanaged and mistreated on a catastrophic scale. And if the lessons of the Aral are ignored, the rest of the planet may get the same treatment at the hands of man. Then, like the looters of the Aral, we may all end up scraping a perilous living in a lethally polluted world.